What's going on guys, this is Rob. And for a long time, you guys have been screaming at me to make a video about toxins. So we were gonna cover the in-betweener today as part of our Omega level series. We're actually gonna postpone that for a week. So next week we'll do it on uh, on Friday, but I thought it'd be cool to make a video explaining uh, basically Patrick Mulligan slash toxin, right? I thought it'd be cool because here's the thing, man. Toxin is OP. This guy is so broken. Okay, so toxin first appeared in uh, Venom versus Carnage volume one in 2004. And he was created by Peter Milligan. Now the whole idea behind this, and in truth, it was kind of an accidental success. One of the things to know when it comes to the idea of symbiotes is that they're usually a product of their time. That at the time that Venom was created in Marvel Comics, it was actually the idea of Jim Shooter and all those guys at Marvel to basically change the way Spider-Man looked. And that's why they gave him a black suit. I wouldn't say the change was reviled, but I will say that there were enough people out there that didn't want to see the iconic blue and red suit go away that Marvel changed it up. And so over a period of time, using a combination of circumstances that both took place inside Spider-Man's comics, as well as uh, really on the publishing side, Peter got rid of the Venom symbiote and then it bonded itself to Eddie Brock and Eddie Brock basically became Venom. Now, following that, you go into Carnage and the introduction of Carnage was a product of its time insofar as by the late 80s and early 90s, Marvel had kind of taken a page out of DC, right? The Dark Knight Returns, Batman comics made stories darker, which again, really started back in 1971 with the night Gwen Stacy died. And so by the time that Carnage hit, Marvel Comics and even comic books as a whole were like super high octane, fast paced, hyper violent. And so the creation of the Carnage symbiote was designed to reflect that environment and was hugely successful, right? Maximum Carnage was a wildly successful story even to this day. And so what ended up happening here is that in 2004, because Marvel was experiencing this sort of shift at the hands of, uh, of Joe Quesada, the idea wasn't necessarily to get rid of Venom and Carnage, but to introduce yet another symbiote building on top of the Life Foundation symbiotes and those we had seen before, but to do it in a way that was starkly different. And so the way this played out is that in the Venom and Carnage storyline, really in the first issue, the two of them and the story itself just kind of opened up with these guys fighting, basically chasing after a guy named, uh, named Patrick Mulligan. And so what was kind of crazy about this is that you didn't exactly know what was happening. And in fact, it wasn't really until Spider-Man showed up on the scene that you started to learn what was actually going on. Now in truth, Spider-Man's involvement here was basically just limited to the fact that like it's Venom, right? And at the time, Eddie Brock was still effectively a villain in Marvel Comics. And so whenever he was roaming around doing something, even if Spider-Man didn't directly intervene, he was always kind of keeping an eye on him, right? I mean, it was really kind of how that played out. And so because of the fact that Venom had showed up at the apartment of a cop and seemingly looked like he was attacking the cop, that in truth, Venom was looking to save uh, Patrick Mulligan basically from Carnage. And what you ended up learning is the fact that Carnage had basically given birth to an offspring of his own in the form of Toxin. And that the way it was explained explained by Venom is that every thousandth generation that the symbiotes potentially have the ability to go crazy, right? To become so psychotic that they could actually lead to the entire destruction of their race. And so where Carnage wanted to destroy uh, the Toxin symbiote because Carnage believed it was a threat to his own existence, Venom actually wanted to raise Toxin in order to turn him into what was basically a productive member of society. And so the idea is that because the symbiote had bonded itself to a cop, it seemed more or less taken care of, but there was no definitive way for Venom to know, hence the reason why he was involved in the first place. Now, Spider-Man didn't initially know this, he just thought Venom was attacking a cop. <laughs> and so this basically led to, uh, to Spider-Man stepping in, and Venom, of course, kind of a bit of a conflict between him and Spider-Man, and so on, and then Carnage finally appeared, and then tried to kill Mulligan. Now, what followed in issues two through really three, if we're being honest with ourselves, even going into issues four, was basically just a cat and mouse game. It was quite literally Venom fighting Carnage, Carnage fighting Venom, Spider-Man trying to keep up, and then fighting both, you know, interchangeably, and then ultimately it all kind of coalesced into issue number four. Now, during this time, uh, Felicia Hardy, who most of you guys know as Black Cat, uh, was really just kind of a person who was thrown into the conflict just because she was basically in the middle of an art heist <laughs> when it all started going down. And it actually saved Mulligan at some point. And then once Mulligan's powers were developing and then he ultimately ended up tracking down Felicia Hardy, that he was basically asking her what's going on because he didn't fully understand what was happening to him with regards to the symbiote that had possessed his body. And so the reason why Felicia Hardy was so important is because because by the time you got to issue number four, Venom was actually getting ready to kill Carnage. But the response of Felicia Hardy as the one who really saved the day was basically saying that if Venom is the father of Carnage and Carnage is the father of Toxin, and these symbiotes basically have the abilities once they reach to their, their thousandth generation to basically lose their mind, then they should really just become like a father and son dynamic to save Toxin, right? To basically rehabilitate Toxin. Now, ultimately Carnage didn't want to, he still wanted to kill him. And it all really fell on Venom. But during this whole time, the major play when 
it came to uh, to Toxin himself was the fact that Mulligan's wife had actually given birth to his son. And the biggest issue that Mulligan struggled with here was that given the nature of the symbiotes themselves, the fact that he didn't fully understand what was going on with him, the fact that he actually almost turned his baby into a symbiote to a degree, had really led to this huge crisis in the fact that he was more of a danger to his family than anything else. And so without really giving any meaningful explanation to his wife, he basically bailed out and then took off. And so the story ultimately ended with Toxin just kind of walking out there on his own. And this is where the accidental success comes into play because it's one of these things where the story ended in such a way to where it could have just been left that way. And if it wasn't well received, nobody would care. The story would just wrap up and he would just kind of be out there in the world. Nobody would know or care what happened to him. Such as it was, people loved it. <laughs> people loved the idea of Toxin, right? They were like, wait a minute, a new symbiote that's more powerful than Carnage and Venom? You're like, yeah, man. People, plus, people love the way Toxin looked, right? Just the kind of combination of the Carnage and Venom colors, right? People just love the design and everything. Truth to tell, it was just the right kind of symbiote story at the right time. And so following this, Marvel, I wouldn't go as far as to say went all out, but they certainly capitalized on it. And so the following year in 2005, Peter Milligan returned again and basically wrote the Toxin six issue miniseries. Now, the reality of this is that this miniseries ran in tandem with the new Avengers comic. And the only reason why this was really significant is because when the new Avengers comic line was being launched by Marvel, right? Following the aftermath of Avengers disassembled, the traditional Avengers roster disbanding and a new one being formed in its place, you had a story that kicked off called The Raft. And The Raft was a really, really cool story. Of course, The Raft being the prison where basically super villains are held, at least those that are seem, uh, seem to be the most dangerous and seemingly the most powerful, right? But regardless of the situation, what it did is that during this story, Electro, who'd actually been contacted by Electra, of course, neither of them related to each other, who was actually a scroll imposter, kind of a precursor to the events of Secret Invasion, that Electro had taken down power to the raft. And when that happened, a ton of criminals escaped. Now, the reality is Peter Milligan writing this comic and Marvel commissioning this comic came hot off the heels of the one question that seemingly every fan had after the original Venom versus Carnage story, which is what can Toxin do? And so that's basically what this comic gave us. Now, it also gave us the nature of Toxin in relation to Patrick Mulligan, as well as how it is the Toxin symbiote compared to like Venom and Carnage regarding its own personality, drive, and ambitions. And so what you got was again, really Peter Milligan just kind of nailing it, right? In the sense that like this, this Toxin series, which is still considered to be one of the best symbiote stories that has been written in a long, long time, focused in one part on the powers of Toxin and in another part on the nature of Toxin. Now the powers of Toxin were given to us in pretty cool displays in the sense that when it comes to like his physical form, for the most part, he usually looks comparable to Spider-Man in size, right? He's not really as beefy or as huge as uh, as Venom is, and he's not really as scrawny and small as Carnage is, but instead he's kind of somewhere in between, but he can kind of go either way. Like we usually whenever he gets pissed off, he just like doubles in size, right? He just becomes enormous. And so you saw him facing off against characters that weren't really big time. And in fact, the idea of Toxin tracking down these different villains like Cobra, The Answer, Wrecker, Piledriver, Razorfist had all actually been tasked to him by Spider-Man. So in a lot of ways, it was really Spider-Man saying, okay, so if you're bonded to, uh, to Patrick Mulligan and you want to be a good guy, then let's see if you can be a good guy, right? And so a lot of it was kind of babysitting to a degree where ultimately Toxin was kind of given a series of tasks to see if he could complete them in a non-lethal fashion. And as a bigger test of that, can Patrick keep his symbiote under control? Even more so than that, it was really kind of Spider-Man observing, not really directly, but kind of behind the scenes, kind of coming to this conclusion, what's the Toxin symbiote really about? And so as far as the relationship between Toxin and Patrick Mulligan went, it was one of these things where Toxin was very much a child in terms of how it functioned, right? Even in terms of its speech, it almost came off childlike. And as a result of this, it was in a lot of ways, Patrick Mulligan taking a child to raise, that he had to teach Toxin the, the nuances and the complexities of morality, right? That just because something is the right thing to do doesn't necessarily mean you should do it, right? Because even though it is the right thing to do, it could cause further suffering later on down the line. And so this kind of, of you know, weird moral compass being taught to Toxin was a little difficult in terms of Patrick's endeavors, but was highly intriguing for us as the reader because we got to see the character evolve in a way that you didn't normally get to see in relation to Venom and Carnage, especially because of the fact that when Venom had bonded to Eddie Brock and Carnage had bonded to Cletus Cassidy, they were basically perfect matches. The idea here was that Eddie Brock had a hatred for, for Peter Parker because 
because he cost Eddie his job. And Venom had a hatred for Spider-Man because Spider-Man cast him off. And because Spider-Man and Peter are the same person, Eddie bonding to Venom was a perfect match. At the same time, the Carnage symbiote basically felt a kind of a uh, sense of abandonment and being cast aside by Venom and then bonding itself to Cletus Cassidy was allowed to just experience this unbridled chaos and carnage seemingly everywhere it went. But where Cletus Cassidy and Eddie Brock embraced their symbiotes, Patrick Mulligan actually tried to control his symbiote, right? Trying to basically bring it under his wing and, and really sort of grow and evolve the symbiote based on his own moral compass. And so in between these instances when Toxin would track down these various villains that were tasked to him by Spider-Man, what you would see were these small little moments where you would see the kind of relationship between him and Patrick. In the same way that you might like placate a child by giving them a toy, one of the things that Patrick had done was actually strike a kind of deal with Toxin. And the deal was that if Toxin would carry out these tasks according to the will or the, the desire of Patrick, basically doing it uh, with non-lethal force, that Toxin would get quote unquote playtime is really how it was referred to in the sense that for two hours every day, Toxin would be the one running the show. And much like you would expect, Toxin loved it. <laughs> it was very childlike in terms of how he reacted to it. It was like, yay, right? And so one of the things that you saw was that Toxin really reacted to a lot of things the way that a child would, right? In terms of a child growing into adolescence, becoming a teenager, things like that. When he read through the laptop of Patrick Mulligan and realized that Patrick had basically disdained the idea of being attached to Toxin, he didn't really like Toxin. He found Toxin to be childlike and he found the process of having to teach Toxin morality to be hugely overwhelming. In effect, he wasn't really ready for fatherhood in that capacity. The Toxin got angry and destroyed the laptop. Now, of course, this led to Toxin trying to steal more. Spider-Man caught him and then yelled at Patrick for basically allowing Toxin to run amok in the in the way that he had, kind of illustrating this idea and, and really explaining to him that when it comes to these symbiotes, that as the host, they're the one that's supposed to be in control, that he's supposed to be like a father here, that you wouldn't just let your child run amok for two hours, especially when they're in such, such a young state, right? Young adolescence somewhere where Toxin really had the, the mindset of around like anywhere between a, a five to a 10 year old, that you wouldn't just let them go do their own thing, that they have to be guided, they have to be controlled. You've got to provide boundaries, right? A kind of uh, system for them to work within. And Toxin's basically desire to break away from that is the way it normally works with kids, right? Testing boundaries, trying to break rules to see what will happen, to see how far they can stretch things. It just goes with the territory of being a dad. The other part of this that you saw that was really, really intriguing was that Toxin really shared or really seemed to have this, this sort of lack of, of confidence in itself. That when it came to beings like Venom, when it came to symbiotes like Carnage, that for the most part, they had historically bonded themselves to other people. And usually their desire to bond to somebody was based on a previously existing emotion like revenge or, or rage or whatever the case happened to be. But because Patrick was the first being that Toxin had ever bonded itself to, Toxin didn't actually believe it could survive being bonded to anybody else. And much like a kind of relationship capacity, it's I can't live without you, right? And so what this did is it led to a really interesting dynamic between the two where it was almost kind of like they need each other in some form or fashion. That Toxin can help Patrick really achieve levels of herodom that he simply wasn't able to do on his own. And Toxin needed Patrick in order to basically become a good guy, to understand that he couldn't just tear through things, he couldn't destroy things, he couldn't be hyper violent in the same way that Carnage was. And so where the conclusion of the Toxin series basically saw Patrick Mulligan and Toxin kind of coming to terms with each other. And in fact, Patrick actually returning back home to his family and officially introducing them to Toxin. The reality is that for about seven years, really six years, if we're being honest, Toxin had vanished. And we didn't really know what was going on. Truth to tell, if I'm a betting man, I would say that the entire idea of Toxin was seemingly designed to be self-contained. In truth, there was a lot going on with Marvel. And the reason why I say this is because it wasn't until 2011 that Toxin came back because of Rick Remender and his run on Venom. And the funny thing about this is that this is basically Agent Venom, right? Now, for those of you guys who don't know who that is, Agent Venom is basically when Flash Thompson became Venom. And as we've mentioned multiple times here on the channel, the Agent Venom run is one of the most popular runs of the Venom character, right? People love Agent Venom and rightfully so. It was exceedingly well-written, especially given the previous struggles that Flash Thompson dealt with and the fact that he was the bully to, to Peter Parker as Spider-Man and, and or really before he was Spider-Man and so on, uh, but also the struggles that Flash Thompson dealt with before going into becoming Agent Venom and then while and after he was Agent Venom, especially when he died. <laughs> 
that's certainly a pretty major struggle. But the idea here under Rick Remender is that Toxin, I wouldn't quite call him a plot device, but he kind of was. The idea of him being on the same level as he was during his original appearances by Peter Milligan basically seemed to be gone. And if we're being honest, it's kind of been that way for a while. And so the way this played out is that you initially had a villain by the name of Blackheart. And Blackheart is basically one of those hell lords that exists out there. I mean, I guess the idea of, of calling him a hell lord is a little premature. He is more the son of Mephisto destined to become a hell lord, but he was ultimately banished from hell. And the desire of Blackheart was to actually bring hell on earth. And one of the things he needed for this was basically the toxin symbiote, or at least a piece of the toxin symbiote. And so as much as old school toxin fans, when I say old school, I mean fan people who were fans of toxin six years before, as much as they hated it, what Rick Remender had basically revealed here is that Blackheart had killed Patrick Mulligan off panel and had gotten his hands on the toxin symbiote. And so the way this had worked is that the toxin symbiote basically had to be freed from this, this container uh, that was being held by Blackheart, which of course this was done by Flash Thompson, uh, Agent Venom, at the behest of Crime Master. And so where Agent Venom ended up confronting like Jack O'Lantern and all these different characters and so on and so forth, basically uh, the toxin symbiote was taken by Jack O'Lantern directly to Crime Master under the belief that once Flash Thompson realized what was going on, that he wouldn't fulfill the mission as it was tasked to him, but it was necessary that he be the one to do it because the Venom symbiote was seemingly the only one that could punch through all the defenses that were there and then attain the uh, the toxin symbiote for itself. I mean, in all honesty, when that happened, like when, when you saw that whole scenario take place, the Venom symbiote didn't want to save the toxin symbiote. He wanted to kill it. <laughs> he was literally like, we have to kill it, right? Like that was the whole thing. And so what this did, where this initial story took place in, in Venom volume two, issues 11 and 12, what you did is you jumped forward from issues 17 to 21 and you dealt with this idea that Crime Master's desire was to create a group called the Savage Six, which was really kind of his own interpretation of the Sinister Six to a degree. And that what ended up happening here is Eddie Brock was basically kidnapped and then essentially was forcefully bonded to the Toxin Symbiote. And so what this did is at the end of this whole story, it actually led to a conflict between Eddie Brock as Toxin and Agent Venom. And what ended up happening here is because Toxin, who was really in control of Eddie at the time, had basically sided with the Savage Six, this led to Flash Thompson stripping the Toxin Symbiote off of Eddie Brock and then throwing it in the fire. And when the idea was that Eddie was going to be saved, instead what happened is the symbiote actually reached out, grabbed Eddie, and then drug him into the fire. And then seemingly Eddie Brock died as well. Now, in reality, because of how this was done and because of how Marvel had been functioning, really from the, the time that Toxin was first introduced, running all the way up into the, the end of like Dark Reign, the idea of the heroic age, so kind of like the conclusion of this 10 year effort by Joe Quesada to basically reshuffle Marvel, by all standards of measurement, Eddie was done, right? It was basically the end of Eddie Brock. There was no need for him anymore. Now, in truth, the death of Eddie as it was handled at the time was done fairly unceremoniously, right? Like quite literally, Eddie Brock gets pulled into the flames and then Flash Thompson's like, well, I mean, there's nothing I can do. My symbiote won't survive it. So only one thing to do now, we got to go save Betty Brand, right? And that was it, right? I mean, it wasn't like some great big, huge grandiose thing. It wasn't like a funeral for Eddie Brock or anything like that. He was basically just removed from the picture and the mantle of Venom seemingly belonged strictly to Flash Thompson. And it looked like he would be the only Venom going forward. Now, the funny thing about this is that if you go back and you read the letters pages in the aftermath of, uh, of Venom 21, fans were pissed, right? Fans of Eddie Brock were mad. They were so angry because they felt like what had been a long-standing member of the Marvel mythos, especially regarding the symbiotes, was just kind of whimsically cast aside to make way for Flash Thompson. This ironically coincided with Rick Remender's run concluding on Agent Venom and so beginning with the Monsters of Evil, you had Cullen Bunn who took over. Now, Toxin didn't immediately come back when Cullen Bunn took over the writing of Venom. Instead, that didn't really happen until a little bit later. And what you actually ended up finding out in issue number 34 was that both Eddie Brock and Toxin had survived, but both of them were imbued with huge amounts of rage that Eddie Brock wanted his Venom symbiote back and Toxin wanted to kill Venom for killing him in the first place, for trying to kill him in the first place. And so the result of this is that the two of them bonded to each other, but they weren't really a, a suitable match, right? They were a match by circumstance, but they weren't really a perfect match in the same way that Eddie Brock was a match for Venom or Cletus Cassidy was a match for Carnage. Now, some of this also had to do with the, the really individual motivations of them, more so Eddie Brock than Toxin himself. That Toxin, sure, wanted to kill Venom, and that's really not the biggest thing in the world, but Eddie's desire was to bond back with the Venom symbiote. And so, I mean, sure, Toxin wanted to kill Venom, and, and really not necessarily Venom, I feel like that's an incorrect statement. Toxin wanted to kill Flash Thompson. Eddie 
Eddie Brock wanted to take the Venom symbiote back. And so because the desire of Eddie was, was not really to truly bond with Toxin, their bond was for the most part incomplete. It didn't really have a massive impact on the powers that they had, but it did impact really the future of the characters and the fact that we as the reader knew they didn't, it seemed like they weren't, weren't really gonna stay a cohesive unit. Now this belief was totally turned on its head in literally the next issue, <laughs> in issue number 35. And the reason why is because one, Eddie Brock and Flash Thompson had to team up to basically save a school. But two, there was this speech that was made by Flash Thompson to Eddie Brock in relation to how they see the world and how they do things. It was one of the most significant moments because this is really the thing that kind of changed Eddie Brock. For those of you guys who are curious how it is that Eddie went from like the guy who was like Venom and he was the villain and he did some bad stuff to the guy that kind of became Eddie Brock as we know him today, this is kind of what started it. And the idea is that Eddie Brock approaches Flash Thompson from the perspective of saying the Venoms can't be controlled, right? The Venoms can't be contained. They have a mind of their own and different things like that. But the response to Flash Thompson is no, you say that because you're a coward. The reality is that the symbiotes can be controlled. I know that because I'm controlling mine. And the reason why I'm controlling mine is because I'm trying to build a life. I'm trying to make up for my past sins. I'm trying to atone for the things that I've done wrong in my life by trying to do some measure of right, given this power that I've had. You, Eddie Brock, are a slave to your past. You're a slave to the mistakes that you've made. You live by them. You let them define you. You let them control you. And because you feel like you cannot control your life, right? In the passenger seat of your own life, everything that comes your way, you simply just let it happen. And so this toxin symbiote, the venom symbiote, these different symbiotes that have possessed you over the years, they basically, uh, they basically engage in their own will. It happened to be that you and Venom had the same motivations, but the reality of you and how you see the world and the reality of what makes you who you are came to bear with Toxin when that symbiote bonded to you and there was nothing you could do to control it. It's not that you can't, it's you don't believe you can because quite literally, Eddie Brock, you have nothing worth living for. And so while that was really like just a hard thing to hear, right? And in a lot of ways, it seemed to kind of crush Eddie Brock. The truth was that Flash Thompson was right. And so what it did is it actually unified Eddie Brock and Toxin in a way that hadn't really been done before in the sense that now they were seemingly a cohesive unit. Again, the big issue you had here though is that Venom and Eddie Brock, they were just synonymous. Anybody who had been a Spider-Man fan for any measure of time had just absolutely felt that Eddie Brock and Venom had to go together. It was one of these things where you simply just couldn't separate them. Now, if we're also being honest, whether it had been Colin Bunn or anybody else, it all basically would have gone back to normal. But in order to keep the toxin symbiote under control, there was a kind of, a, I guess, a, a drug-based cocktail that was used that the toxin symbiote would only ever really come out when it needed to. Now, all this really basically ended when you went into Jerry Conway's Carnage run, which I really enjoyed. That's the Carnage run where you deal with like Carnage, the Dark Hole, Cthone, all that kind of stuff. And so what you had here was a younger woman uh, by the name of uh, Jubileel. I think it's how you pronounce her name. I'm not going to swear by it. I probably screwed it up, but Jubileel Von Scotter. <laughs> the important thing here is that she had received what was basically a dark hold modified uh, version of the Carnage symbiote that had kind of been bonded to her, right? To, to allow her to operate as basically a kind of agent of Carnage to a degree. But the way this played out is that because the power of Carnage with Cthone was so astronomical that Eddie Brock actually gave his toxin symbiote to Jubileel so she could destroy Carnage by merging it with her symbiote as well as the Ray's symbiote. Now, what ended up happening is that with this defeat also came what was seemingly the destruction of all, all the symbiotes and Jubileel herself, right? That Cthone was finally defeated given the fact that if he was able to emerge, he would basically bring hell on earth. So it was literally everybody trying to stop Cthone, <laughs> which succeeded. But in the process, the toxin symbiote was destroyed. Now, the big concern here that a lot of people had is what's ever going to happen to the toxin symbiote. And when I say the big concern, I really mean only those who were reading it at the time, because by way of what had happened between Rick Remender's run and Colin Bunn's run, while what happened with toxin was kind of cool, the writing was on the wall. You knew it was only a matter of time before toxin was just written out of the Marvel mythos and nothing was ever going to come of him again, which was really kind of disappointing because he was one of these characters who just never really had a chance to shine in any real, real impactful and important way. And so all this came to a head during Donny Cates' run 
one with the King and Black story. And as most of you guys know, the King and Black story basically dealt with the arrival of Null, the symbiote god, showing up on Earth and basically conquering the entirety of the universe and then spreading in an outward direction. During this time, Toxin, along with the other symbiotes, really the uh, the Life Foundation symbiotes, had essentially re-emerged. But for Toxin himself, he actually ended up bonding himself to a kid named Bren Waters. And of course, we talked about this during our Extreme Carnage video from yesterday, so you're welcome to get caught up on it if you want to. A lot of this went directly into Extreme Carnage itself in the sense that Toxin basically fought alongside Flash Thompson, who had been returned following his death, and had basically become Agent Anti-Venom, so he wasn't really Agent Venom anymore. That title had now gone back to Eddie Brock, and that in turn, working alongside these guys, basically Toxin was able to help, uh, you know, Flash Thompson and, and a few other members of the team basically end up defeating Carnage, you know, at his attempt at a return, and that was basically it, right? But for the most part, Toxin is one of these characters that I feel like we've said this so much in recent years. Toxin is one of these characters that Marvel introduced, never gave any real measurement of time to, and then killed him off. But I really think Toxin is one of these characters that can really shine in Marvel Comics, right? He is very, 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 very cool. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this to an end. Uh, thank you guys for watching. If you guys are interested in seeing any of the stories that we talked about here, we might do Vision, uh, Venom versus Carnage and, and just do like the actual origin of, uh, of Toxin. But if you guys are, are interested in any of that, let me know down in the comment section and I will catch you all later. Peace.